Y ahora vamos a dar paso a, a la ponencia de Rohit eh, Guillasu. Eh, su ponencia es Acción Climática para el Patrimonio Mundial de la Política a la Acción. Rohit Guillasu es arquitecto conservador y profesional de la gestión de riesgos en la India. Actualmente trabaja para el ICROM como gestor de proyectos de patrimonio urbano, cambio climático y gestión de riesgos y desastres. Rohit ha trabajado además para el Instituto para la Mitigación de Desastres en Paisaje Cultural Urbano y en la Universidad Ritsumeikan de Kioto. Ha sido además, entre los años 2010 y 2019, presidente del Comité Científico Internacional de ICOMOS para Preparación Ante Riesgos y en los últimos 10 años, miembro electo del Comité Ejecutivo de ICOMOS. Sin más, le damos la palabra a Rohit. Muchas gracias. Is how to integrate disaster risk reduction and climate action in heritage management of world heritage properties uh, from policies to action. So, uh, in this, uh, first, let me start with explaining about ECROM. I think many of you must be knowing about ECROM, uh, the organization I come from, uh, the International Center for the Study of the Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property. Uh, it is an intergovernmental organization that works for 137 member states, uh, and it is promoting conservation of all forms of heritage uh, in every region in the world. So it was established in 1956, and we work with, uh, uh, with heritage professionals from different fields, uh, from scientists, conservators, museum curators, and uh, we work in four, uh, five areas of training, information, research, cooperation, and advocacy. And uh, Spain is, of course, one of the important member states of ECROM. So I'm very pleased to be here and present uh, today. Uh, of course, we are all talking about climate change and how it affects cultural heritage. So I'm not going to talk about what climate change is doing, because I think we all know what it is doing. Uh, the global temperature that is increasing, uh, and also how the precipitation is increasing, uh, we know where we are heading. And now the recent IPCC report already tells us uh, that we are now uh, really in a situation where if we don't do anything now, probably we'll be uh, a little bit uh, in a difficult situation and not very far future. And in this process, I will also like to say that this temperature change uh, is there much more in cities. So if our heritage is located in the middle of urban environment or in the middle of big cities, I think we are going to face much more problems from a higher temperature range. You can see in the slide that in 2050, many of these uh, cities are going to have an extremely high uh, temperature uh, increase. So that's the other issue that we have to be always uh, uh, mindful of. And on, at the same time, we are very much concerned about the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, which are a huge problem. And if we don't do anything even now, uh, we will still be having an increase in the emissions for the next few years. So I think you can see that how the red curve is really progressing. And if we don't do much, I think we are in for a big trouble. Uh, so another thing we have to think about is how do you deal with these greenhouse gas emissions? and the associated risks uh, that are there with that, uh, related to that. The third point, which is important to also connect with, and when we talk about climate change, is the impact on climate-related disasters. Now, those disasters can be floods, or these could be storms, or uh, hurricanes. Uh, uh, they can be also droughts. And we all know that these kind of disasters are also increasing. Uh, so that's also another kind of an impact of climate change. Now, we all know what has happened in Germany and in Belgium uh, very recently with uh, so many uh, historic towns being affected because of extreme high rains, uh, completely unprecedented in the past. And, and that's also a huge uh, issue that uh, we, we, are, we have been facing with so many floods happening around the world. And of course, many of our historic cities are much more vulnerable. Uh, because uh, of the infrastructure is, is old, it is not uh, ready to take so much uh, water, uh, you know, at some uh, quickly. So we have issues of uh, archaeological sites, which are located right in the middle of the urban areas. And because in the middle of the urban areas, it's very, you know, many times, if there's huge flooding, 
uh, water will accumulate in these archaeological areas also. So that's the other uh, big issue. Uh, how do we deal with many of the sites which are in the middle of uh, uh, high, every dense, dense urban areas? Uh, we are also facing uh, forest fires or bushfires, and you must have heard uh, recently uh, in August this year, we had huge fires in Italy and in Eastern Europe, uh, in Greece, uh, in Turkey. Uh, and so, uh, of course, a lot of heritage structures uh, which are located in the forested areas uh, are, of course, at high risk. Uh, because uh, with the high temperatures and with the extreme uh, uh, bushfires, they are going to be uh, at extremely high risk of getting damaged. So that's the other, other challenge. Uh, one of the challenges that we have to also think about is uh, how our conservation practice is going to be impacted because of climate change. Because, uh, you know, the, the, temp the materials whether it is adobe or mud constructions or stone, uh, they are uh, responding to a certain climatic condition. And if that climatic condition goes through a change, uh, you may actually have to deal with the preservation of the physical fabric, whether it is about stone preservation uh, in a very different way. You cannot use the same techniques that you used to use before because a lot of material will go through different kinds of deterioration processes. And those deterioration processes uh, will have to be understood. Uh, and you know, in many areas, we face uh, new kind of insects because of the high humidity conditions, you know, like termites, uh, where there were no such insects before. So you have to kind of deal with, uh, uh, with the solutions uh, to such kind of issues as well. So uh, this is another kind of a huge, uh, uh, I would say, uh, challenge for us as a heritage uh, professionals. Uh, how do we address uh, different adapting to the new environmental context in terms of dealing with the structures and materials, traditional structures and materials, because uh, uh, they will not be able to um, uh, work in the new context. And then, uh, the accelerated rate of erosion, which is another, uh, of course, erosion or deterioration was always there, but we also find that with climate change, many of our monument sites are located in areas where there is very high rate of erosion, uh, especially if they are along the river or along the coast, uh, we are facing uh, a challenge of uh, addressing this uh, faster erosion processes. So the point I would like to draw here also, which is uh, critical, is that when we deal with our world heritage properties, it's very important that we think about all kinds of threats uh, that can come together in a heritage site. So, you know, it cannot be only a question of sea level rise. It cannot be a question of only a uh, cyclone or hurricane or flooding or fire. In fact, many of these things, issues will combine together. So our strategies for disaster risk management and for climate adaptation will have to address the complexity of dealing with multiple hazards, you know, uh, how they combine together and create this complex crisis is something that is very important for us to address in our uh, plans. So as I was explaining to you earlier, uh, one of the challenges that we have now uh, is a high rate of urbanization because cities have grown and uh, because of the higher density of people living in cities, a lot of heritage sites in urban areas uh, and especially if you have tourists coming there. So if you have very high number of uh, visitors, uh, of course, uh, you have a huge challenge. Uh, if there is a if, if there is any kind of event that may take place, so there is this issue of uh, of urbanization or urban growth, and you know we have to understand one thing that I wanted to really emphasize that whether we talk about climate change, or we talk about development, or we talk about uh, managing some other kind of events or disasters or risks, they are all affecting each other. So we cannot look at climate change only in isolation. 
uh, it's not only a question of what can I do for climate change without looking into other issues of development, issues of uh, my conservation treatment at the site, the issue of dealing with uh, extreme high, uh, you know, uh, disaster situations. So all those factors have to be looked at, um, you know, in, in, in combination. So uh, if you have your local ecology is getting destroyed because of new development, of course, when you have a very high rain, uh, and there is no way for water to di to dissipate or the water to spread uh, because we have built on on many of those water uh, uh, canals uh, we will create a lot more issue uh, for our heritage sites so i think these issues have to be seen a little bit beyond uh, heritage sites and have to be understood in the larger context because that's the most important thing sometimes we are so much focused on our heritage uh, building or the monument that we forget that the real issue lies in the broader context. So if we have to really address the issue of climate change uh, for world heritage properties, most important for us is to think about uh, the larger context in which we are going to work. So uh, let me move to the uh, to this example where you know a lot of these uh, water canals are or water systems are no longer functioning. So if you have an extreme high rain, uh, there is no way that you will have water, uh, you know, going ahead. Uh, the other point I wanted to also uh, talk about, which is very critical here, is that there is also a lot of traditional knowledge which is there in our world heritage properties. You know, many of those have always evolved in relation to their local context. You know, if you look at many of our world heritage properties, uh, they are taking into account uh, local uh, geographical context, uh, the local availability of uh, natural species, uh, you know, like flora or fauna. Uh, they take into account uh, um, the local, uh, uh, you know, uh, temperature conditions. So they have always evolved in relation to, uh, to the local uh, context. And so we have a lot to learn even in terms of uh, the, the traditional knowledge for adapting to climate. And uh, somehow we need to also look back and see how they were originally designed and how they have been adapting to the climate uh, in the past so that we can then learn from it and then uh, maybe be better prepared uh, for the future. So, I mean, that's another important uh, area to really look at. Now I'm moving to uh, what uh, UNESCO uh, did in terms of um, the update on the climate change policy for world heritage properties. Uh, this was uh, recently introduced in the General Assembly of UNESCO. And maybe some of you know that unfortunately, for some reasons, I think more political than technical, uh, uh, this policy has not been approved yet. Uh, but uh, for last uh, three years, we have been working on this uh, policy for uh, climate change on world heritage properties. And I would like to just explain to you a few of the important findings uh, that we had from this uh, uh, preparation of this policy uh, while we were drafting it over last few uh, months. So when we started this discussion on this policy with the online consultation, you know, we did a, uh, we, we did a survey among uh, uh, many respondents. You can see from 97 countries, uh, and you can see how they were geographically distributed and, uh, and how many responses we got. So uh, what we observed was that many of the site managers and many of you are actually site managers. So you will understand that many of the site managers are actually observing uh, climate related uh, negative impacts on world heritage properties. So you could see how they were telling us about the different kinds of impacts whether they are from extreme rainfall events uh, to precipitation change uh, to the drought frequency and severity or humidity change uh, or sea level rise. So you can see that 53%, for example, of the world heritage properties actually tell us that there are extreme rainfall events now. So, you know, it gives us a kind of a, enough uh, evidence to say that uh, these are the important issues that our sites have to be prepared for. Uh, also, I would like to mention, uh, this was very interesting finding we found, we had that when we think about climate related impacts, uh, we should also think about 
the direct impact and the indirect impacts. So there is all there are also impacts in terms of the costs for maintenance and management. Um, there is of course direct damage, uh, <clears throat> but there is also progressive deterioration of historic fabric. Um, there is also impact on tourism. So a lot of revenues are being lost, uh, which are coming from tourism. So you know we when we think about the impacts of climate change. It's also important for us to look at <clears throat> both the direct impacts and the indirect impacts, the impacts on the physical fabric, but also the social impacts and the economic impacts. So that's something we have to always uh, consider. <clears throat> so here you can see uh, all the impacts that we had figured out. Uh, many of these impacts are also with regards to uh, the changes in the biodiversity, uh, what is the impact on the local communities or indigenous peoples, uh, how the landscape is going through a change. Uh, one of the things that we found uh, was there are water shortages in many of the sites. And then uh, this is, I feel, an important thing to think about. Uh, that is the loss of intangible heritage. Uh, because often when we think about the, the tangible heritage, you know, of course, world heritage is all about physical or tangible heritage, but there is also a lot of intangible heritage connected to it. And uh, I mean, that is also kind of at high loss. Uh, uh, and so we need to also think about what can happen to people's uh, cultural practices uh, or the other kind of festivals that take, that take place because of the impact of the climate change. So, um, so just to, um, Continue with that uh, findings. We also kind of understood the how the glaciers are getting lost and what could be the impact of those. Uh, also, there are uh, issues of migration or involuntary. You know, the people are displaced uh, from their location because they cannot live there anymore, whether because of uh, uh, because the temperature environment is not uh, comfortable anymore. So, and then of course there is also increased instances of social and other kind of conflicts and violence because of climate change. So it's it's really important that we consider all these different factors uh, while we talk about climate change. And uh, after our, uh, you know, we we asked them uh, the respondents to talk about what are the key challenges for implementing measures for climate change. I mean, we all now appreciate that climate change is affecting our heritage. But we also need to find out what are the key gaps or what are the key challenges, why we are not able to implement measures. So these were actually classified into three different uh, parts. Uh, the first important thing that everybody mentioned was there is not enough financial and human resources for this. So one of the key hurdles for implementation is how can we get enough financial and human resources to in order to do some climate action for World Heritage properties. The second important factor that a challenge that was brought out was that there are not enough policies and legislations. So of course, many countries, I'm sure Spain also has thought about uh, policies for climate change, but maybe heritage is not appearing in it. So what is important is how can we integrate heritage in our national level climate policies? You know, So uh, that is something that you also have to go back and look whether uh, climate-related policies at the national level at least have a section on heritage in it, because that will be uh, really important. And then, of course, you can have more heritage-specific policies also. But in the national climate-related policies, you also need to have heritage as uh, one of the important sections. And the third uh, uh, thing that we realized as a gap for implementation is that we don't have enough capacity at the moment. Uh, in terms of, uh, we don't have capacity to assess or monitor climate change impacts. Uh, you know, this is a huge problem. Uh, we don't have the data, you know, or even if the data is collected, there is no common point where we can at least understand what is happening. So assessment and monitoring of climate change impacts is definitely one of the key uh, capacity gap that we have at the moment. We still lack uh, manuals or guidelines or toolkits which can help us to know what exactly we should do. Uh, in this area, we have just started to work at ECROM and at UNESCO as well, but there's a lot of more work to be done. So we need to prepare enough knowledge resources. 
which can guide site managers to undertake climate action. And, and thirdly, uh, we need to uh, understand uh, how we can make some practical actions at the site level, because you know we have many big global models, right? We know what climate change is going to do in the future. So we know those predictive modeling, but what does that imply at the site level? You know, what should I prepare for as a site manager in the future in terms of my day-to-day -day actions, in terms of maintenance, uh, conservation work, uh, in terms of monitoring, that still needs a lot of work. So we need to take this global kind of larger discourse down to a much more practical level at the site, uh, at the site level. So that's the other uh, important gap that we found uh, through this survey. So uh, these were the key recommendations for this updated policy uh, document. Uh, one thing which uh, we are really emphasizing is that we need to have a thematic approach. You know, what the climate action you will take for archaeological sites is very different than the one that you will take for cities, historic cities. It will be very different that you will take for a stone monument or a stone structure compared to a wooden structure. So you need to kind of have a very thematic approach uh, on depending on the kind of climate change factors we are looking at and the typologies of heritage that you are dealing with. You know, you cannot have one common guideline for all kinds of heritage, for all kinds of climate change related factors. So we need to create something more tailored uh, for each kind, uh, each type of uh, factor and type of heritage. Uh, we should think about the vulnerability of intangible heritage. I already mentioned that's an important element because uh, if we cannot deal with the people who are affected because of climate change, uh, just dealing with the physical fabric of a world heritage property is not enough. So we need to kind of really connect it well with, uh, with the people who are living in and around uh, these uh, world heritage sites. Uh, and very important conclusion, uh, which we are emphasizing also in this updated policy document is the connection between nature and culture. And you know, I, I'm sure many of you are aware that there's a lot of work being going on right now uh, between many international organizations, uh, you know, ECROM, uh, IUCN, ECOMOS have been working on linking nature and culture. And in fact, this is important for climate change because a lot of our monuments or our heritage buildings or sites, you cannot deal with them by not connecting it to what's happening in the in the in relation to the uh, to its natural setting, you know, in terms of uh, the rivers or the the geographical landscape or the uh, the climate. So we need to connect nature and culture uh, very importantly uh, in this uh, process of addressing climate change, and then uh, emphasize on the risk assessment for world heritage properties. We need to really undertake climate risk assessment. Uh, for our world heritage properties in a very systematic manner. And based on uh, modeling, uh, you know, it is all about what can happen 20 years, 50 years, and 100 years down the line. And we should really utilize all that is available today to create those kind of scenarios uh, that can affect our heritage sites. And then accordingly, you know, uh, deal with them in a more proactive manner. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it's important to develop and update uh, baseline data for assessing the impacts of climate change on world heritage properties, uh, because without a baseline data, and that's why uh, we, we need to collect all the kind of evidences which tell us about the loss on heritage uh, sites and really uh, so that that kind of data will really tell us what we must uh, do uh, in terms of uh, um, utilizing that data for taking proactive action. And of course, uh, it also encourages uh, state parties or the countries to actively participate in monitoring, adapting, uh, mitigating, and responding to climate change impacts. So we have identified these four different aspects, which are all important. Uh, monitoring, of course, that we monitor what is happening. Adapting in the sense we want to adapt to uh, how things should uh, change in the future, uh, how our conservation practice should be adapted to the changing environmental uh, conditions. Mitigation in terms of mitigation, mitigating the carbon emissions through what we do in our sites, uh, what kind of infrastructure we put in place, 
uh, what is the tourism uh, plan we put are we thinking about reducing the carbon footprint uh, with those new developments so these are the four important elements that we need to consider uh, for our uh, world heritage properties so uh, that's uh, where uh, we were even emphasizing the need for developing monitoring systems uh, with reference to the potential impacts of climate change on world heritage properties. So what kind of monitoring uh, we should really put in place uh, at what regular intervals we should do it, what should be the coordination with different uh, departments. This is the other issue I want to highlight that heritage organizations and heritage professionals have very little coordination with climate agencies or climate related professionals. So what we need to do also is to enhance the cooperation or collaboration between the heritage sector and the climate sector. Uh, and there's a lot to be done at the country level, at the local district or the state level or provincial level. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done in that area. We also need to build a synergy with latest international conventions. So one of the reasons why we could initiate this updated policy document was because uh, we, we there have been some very important international conventions recently, you know, starting with Paris uh, uh, Convention in 2015, uh, which actually talked about the global limit to the how much can we accept uh, based on the latest scientific data. Uh, we have also a lot of conventions in UNESCO, uh, for example, the Sustainable Development Convention, there's a Sendai framework on disaster risk management. So we need to, and we have, of course, sustainable development goals. So it is very important that we see the connection between these different policies. You see, this is, a, this is I feel, a big problem because we have these important policies in place, but these policies don't talk to each other. So how can we have a synergy uh, between these different policies because ultimately they are all connected uh, with one another. And as I was mentioning how we can have improved capacity for uh, integrating climate mitigation and adaptation uh, for the management and conservation practices in our world heritage properties. And I was showing you the examples in, in this policy document, we are really emphasizing the importance of traditional knowledge on climate change for mitigation and adaptation. How can we build on that uh, knowledge that is existing? Uh, emphasizing the importance of community participation for adaptation and mitigation, because this cannot be done only by the, uh, by the laws uh, or by formal institutions. Uh, you need to engage local communities uh, in a better way. Uh, so how can we engage with them? Now, the next point I want to really uh, emphasize a little bit because every country prepares nomination dossiers. Uh, periodic reporting is done for the sites that are already on the list. And then there are also state of conservation reports. Now, um, many of these, uh, if you look at uh, many of the nomination dossiers and periodic reporting exercises, they of course talk about climate change, but there is no clear articulation of what are the vulnerabilities and risks to the property due to climate change. And also, how, what are the different mitigation and adaptation measures that are needed to address them? So it is really important now. And you know, we, what we were thinking, uh, now the policy is stuck. So we have to wait when the policy gets uh, uh, approved. But we are really thinking that there needs to be a guidance document, which tells the site managers, which tells the countries uh, which are proposing new nominations uh, which also inform uh, when you, uh, the site managers, when they uh, prepare the periodic reporting uh, for their sites, uh, or when the missions are taken for site state of conservation reports, that there's a clear understanding on what is the vulnerability and risk uh, of a world heritage property due to climate change. Because at, the, at this moment, it is not very clear. People don't know how to kind of uh, really articulate it clearly. And that needs to be given as a guidance document. And then we need to propose, uh, you know, uh, what are the existing and what are the proposed mitigation and ad adaptation measures to address them. So uh, uh, let me get to the next one. Uh, and then, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, climate change mitigation and adaptation cannot be dealt with in isolation. We cannot say that make a climate mitigation plan or climate adaptation plan. 
what we need to do it is not going to work what we need to do is that we should consider climate mitigation and adaptation in changing the way we do the management plan or management system for our world heritage property so climate change is a lens through which we can update our management plans and systems we don't need to create a separate plan for climate change adaptation or mitigation so sometimes uh, many people think we have a huge problem of climate change now we should make a plan for climate action actually there is there is no need for making a separate plan what we need to do is to update our management plans and systems to make sure that they address the uh, climate change related issues uh, uh, in their almost uh, in their day to day management practice and i already mentioned about the synergy between the international and regional conventions and the national and local policies for climate change and heritage see one of the things about climate change is that there are no political borders for climate change right it is affecting globally so one of the key things for this to work effectively is to work at different levels uh, you need to work at the global level but you also need to work at the regional level you know so countries which are neighboring you know countries they should must have a pay and world heritage properties is a is a world heritage convention is a good platform by which one can do regional cooperation with neighboring countries to see how there could be a more synergy in what they do at the at the regional level and of course there are a lot of obligations that uh, countries may have at the national level and then uh, we need to think about as i mentioned tools and procedures for climate risk assessment mitigation so what all we need to do uh, we need to strengthen national and local legislations and we need to provide and this i feel is the most important part i think for site managers they really lack this there is a gap here uh, we need to provide mechanisms for implementation at the property level uh, what really needs to be done and then we need to have some good practices no we need to share some good examples of what is being done so that they can serve as an inspiration for what uh, should be done uh, at uh, at any site and of course this has to be also translated into different languages so i'm going to uh, conclude this part of my presentation by uh, summarizing some of the um, some of the recommendations uh, that are necessary for world heritage property level implementation something that should be done at the property level i'm not talking about the national level i'm talking not talking about the international level but what can we do at the site level so at the site level uh, as i have been mentioning undertaking climate vulnerability and risk assessment can be extremely helpful because it will tell us what is happening and what may happen in the future uh, we need to develop and implement climate adaptation strategies uh, which are consistent with climate adaptation frameworks developed at the national level so whether these adaptation strategies means how we want to change the way we do conservation practice whether it means the way we do change our maintenance systems uh, we need to kind of spell it out very clearly uh, and we should link it to the national level adaptation frameworks then uh, of course every site should have monitoring of the climate hazards uh, and so making a good monitoring system uh, is really important and how can we enhance the adaptive capacity of the property like how can we make it better in terms of capacities is is really required uh, so monitoring is definitely one of the key things that uh, can be done at the site level uh, then comes the implementation of management practices that reduce vulnerability and increase the resilience of properties to pressure such as urbanization and tourism and this i want to emphasize even in the beginning i was mentioning that we cannot have a climate action plan separately uh, sometimes we need to address the way we do tourism strategy in our sites are we thinking about carbon emissions are we thinking about uh, how urbanization is increase is uh, changing the ecology of the place and because of that our sites are going to be more prone to flooding maybe if there is heavy rainfall so when we talk about strategies for climate action we need to combine them uh, with the strategies for urbanization urban development and tourism and then of course we need to engage a lot with traditional knowledge holders and local communities because there is a lot of knowledge there with them because they have adapted to the changing climate over uh, generations so we should build on that knowledge and then of course uh, quantifying uh, and or where appropriate reducing 
are sometimes offsetting any net greenhouse gas emissions associated with the property. So we need to work out a strategy, right? How are we going to do this uh, in, in terms of the actual actions that we are going to do? And lastly, but I think most importantly, is to do a lot of capacity building, uh, knowledge mobilization and, and awareness raising because we still need to uh, make communities sensitive to this issue. We need to make uh, institutions and other stakeholders, and we need to build the capacities of site managers uh, to address this issue, whether it is about assessment, monitoring, whether it is about mitigation or adaptation. So I, I want to emphasize that climate change really cannot be dealt in isolation, and we need to be always uh, keeping that uh, very much in our in our mind. Uh, I would like to now uh, move to uh, what ECROM has been doing in this area. Um, uh, we have been involved with the drafting of the climate change policy uh, work, but we are also now working a lot on redefining heritage management practice uh, for world heritage properties with risk lens. And ECROM and IUCN have a world heritage leadership program Maybe some of you have uh, been part of the site manager forum that was organized during the World Heritage Committee session, uh, where uh, many site managers uh, from World Heritage Properties uh, were participated. And we are now trying to work on a new kind of framework, which will become the guideline or the guidance for, uh, for preparing heritage management plan. Uh, for your own world heritage properties. So there's a lot of focus in this management, uh, new management framework on mitigation, preparedness, and adaptation. Uh, there is also a focus on multi-hazard approach. When I say multi-hazard, I want to bring you back to the example I was giving you of, uh, of, uh, um, of uh, this site in, uh, in, Zimbabwe, in, in Tanzania, where we need to think about not just a flood, but we need to think about fire, we need to think about other kind of uh, threats. And now we are facing COVID-19 pandemic, it's also connected to climate change in many ways, the way things are changing. So multi-hazard approach uh, means that it cannot be a separate plan for earthquake, separate plan for flood or for hurricane or a separate, we have been preparing these kind of separate plans uh, and a separate climate plan. We need to look at all the threats whether they are human made, man made, or they are made by the nature, we need to think of a, a plan that is multi hazard, that is consists of all the uh, linkages, you know, uh, also connected to urbanization and tourism. And then the third uh, important element of this new heritage management framework is that we want to follow an approach of building back better to reduce vulnerabilities. Building back better doesn't mean that we build the structure back new. No, it, it should not be confused with that. But the whole idea about build back better approach, which actually comes from uh, international disaster management framework, from uh, Sendai framework, as it is called, is that we want to reduce vulnerability to climate in the future. So we need to do some kind of changes in our site, the way we manage our site, whether in terms of the drainage systems in our site, whether they are in terms of the way we have communication or coordination between different uh, organizations or institutions in the site. We need to uh, have a new approach which aims at reducing the vulnerability to climate uh, in the way we uh, deal with this uh, management itself. So uh, at ECROM and ICN, we are advocating for a place-based approach for heritage management. Uh, what we are now trying to work with the uh, uh, World Heritage uh, Center, and we are trying to promote that management of our heritage property is not only a question of managing the property itself. It has to be linked very much to the larger context in which the site is located. Uh, and, and that larger context can be the larger environmental context, the larger geographical context, the larger institutional context. So it is no longer only a question of uh, a heritage institution it needs a kind of work with multiple institutions uh, with their strong collaboration that this can actually take place. For World Heritage cities, the cities that are located uh, in the, um, we have to have an approach which is territorial. And you already are aware of 
uh, HUL approach or historic urban landscape approach, which is actually saying that we need to look at cities within its larger context. So even for the uh, for cities, we need to connect. You know, we cannot make a plan only for the world heritage city itself. We need to look at the new city and the old city and its surrounding areas and the rural areas together and need to have a territorial or a regional strategy in place. So that's the other important lesson uh, that we have. And that, of course, means that we need to look for new approaches, uh, tools, uh, methodologies, and learnings uh, uh, in, from our traditional knowledge systems as well. Uh, there is an importance uh, that we have to give to the lens of resilience, uh, which actually means that we want to not just uh, come back to the situation as it was before. There is no way we can come back. You know, earlier we used to say uh, disaster recovery means that you are recovering back to how it was before. Uh, we cannot recover back because our situation is vulnerable. So we need to bounce forward uh, and make it better. Uh, so that is where the concept of uh, building back better is really important. And this essentially really means uh, that all these different you know, heritage conservation and management, whether we talk about disaster risk reduction, whether we talk about sustainable development or climate action, they all have to come together and they all have to work together. And we need to kind of find out ways in which we, our world heritage property management addresses these issues together because separately uh, they will never make any effort. So at this moment, we are updating the resource manual on managing disaster risk to cultural, uh, to actually not only cultural heritage, it is to uh, both cultural and natural heritage. And we are introducing all these important things that I just mentioned to you, where we are actually including climate change as one of the factors. Uh, so we are not making a separate manual on climate change, but we are saying that if you want to manage disaster risks, you should factor in climate change as well and how it affects disasters. So, uh, so these are the few important considerations and learning from COVID-19 pandemic, we are also including biohazards in this new updated version of the manual, which hopefully will be uh, ready by next year. So we are kind of at the moment working on that and hopefully this will provide us with a good, uh, uh, you know, resulting uh, guidelines or framework that can be put in practice. So I just want to conclude with this uh, diagram that we have just uh, kind of been working on. So when we deal with World Heritage Sites, uh, we look at different kinds of disaster risks, uh, including those from the climate change. Uh, we need to look at not only managing disaster risks, but we need to look at World Heritage also as a solution because there are a lot of knowledge and uh, practice which is there in World Heritage, which can give us ideas on how do we manage our uh, nature, uh, uh, ourselves to deal with uh, these issues. So this is about why on uh, reducing vulnerability, enhancing resilience, protecting values, and very importantly, what we are including now is maintaining ecosystems and cultural functions. So you can see this is the way we want to bring nature and culture together by saying that we want to maintain ecosystems, you know, by looking at the larger territory, but we also need to maintain the cultural functions, you know, our, what our cultural sites tell us. We need to, of course, look at uh, the element of climate change related hazards and other hazards, look at all the vulnerability factors along with the capacities and then understand what disaster risks are created for people and values. And then uh, managing disaster risks, as I was mentioning, uh, has to also look at world heritage as a solution uh, in terms of building cultural resilience, uh, eco-based TRR, uh, or nature-based solutions, uh, which can really provide us effective response for world heritage properties. So that's where I would like to end my presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Muchas gracias a ti por por estar hoy con nosotros y compartir tu, tu experiencia, tu conocimiento. Tu ponencia eh, ha supuesto una aportación muy importante a este encuentro, eh, tanto por lo que has eh, explicado del trabajo de ICROM y de ICOMOS, eh, muy revelador el que hayas compartido los datos de esa encuesta que habéis realizado para la redacción del documento de, de Política de Cambio Climático en Bienes Patrimonio Mundial, 
eh, y, de, y esas conclusiones de esa encuesta creo que para todos van a ser bastante eh, ilustrativas e interesantes. Eh, también eh, eh, me ha gustado mucho la idea de que hay que tener en cuenta siempre ese eh, patrimonio cultural inmaterial asociado y la necesidad de que haya sinergia entre las distintas convenciones de UNESCO y del, y del Acuerdo de París para poder implementar todas estas medidas. Y por último, eh, que tú has eh, subrayado como lo más importante es que, pese a que es una cuestión de contexto, sí que todas esas medidas tienen que alcanzar el nivel del plan de gestión del bien patrimonio mundial en particular para que eh, quede reflejado, al igual que ocurre en las inscripciones en la, de las candidaturas y en los informes periódicos, en esos planes de gestión individuales quede reflejado la vulnerabilidad y el riesgo que está sometido el bien patrimonio mundial. Y bueno, pues, pues muchísimas gracias por todas estas aportaciones, como digo, eh, que van a ser de, de muchísima utilidad para el resto de, de, del encuentro. Y gracias por contar, eh, por poder contar contigo.